Welcome to the Blogger Genius Podcast brought to you by Milo Tree. Here's your host, Jillian Leslie. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to the Blogger Genius Podcast. I'm your host, Jillian Leslie, and I am a serial entrepreneur. I build businesses with my husband, and I've also been recording this podcast, gosh, for four years. The product I am most excited about right now that we are building is called Milo Tree Cart, and it is a way to easily sell and get paid for digital products on the internet. Now, somebody recently said, yeah, but what does that really mean? So I wanted to tell you what it is and also why we built it and a little bit about our philosophy. So what it is, is if you want to set up a paid workshop, a membership, coaching, and coming soon, digital downloads, this is the platform for you. We offer you unlimited products and the best part, free sales pages, unlimited, that we host for you that you can set up in, gosh, five to 10 minutes. Now, we do not charge a monthly fee like a lot of our competitors like Samcart or Thrivecart or Kajabi or Teachable. We are a much less expensive platform than these. We only make money when you do. We take a 5% transaction fee and that is it. And we did this because of our philosophy. Our philosophy is we want to put out incredibly easy solutions for you. And the best part is we want you to have fun with it. It's so easy to use. We want you to get creative thinking of all the products that you could sell to your audience. So head to milotreecart.com, sign up for your free account, start creating some digital products and see what connects with your audience. If you'd like me to help you get set up, just email me Jillian at MiloTree.com and we'll get on a call and we'll get you set up. For today's episode, I've got a really good one. I am interviewing Christina Hitchcock and Corinne Schmidt, and these are the two women behind The Smart Influencer. They coach bloggers and online entrepreneurs to work smarter. What I really like about this episode is we elevate up and look at the landscape for how bloggers and creators actually grow businesses and make money. If you've been struggling with this or if you want a really clear view of what it looks like, to build a successful business, what the stages are that you will go through, what the different revenue streams look like, I think you are going to really like this episode. So without further delay, here is my interview with Christina and Corinne from The Smart Influencer. Christina and Corinne, welcome to the Blogger Genius Podcast. Thanks so much for for having us. (laughs) I love you guys in unison. (laughs) Well, each of you like introduce yourself so they understand, can hear your different voice and share just a little bit about your background and how you got into blogging. Okay. I'll start. I'm Christina and um, I am Corinne's partner in crime. And I started blogging in 2010. Um, I created a food blog website way back in the day after watching the movie, Julie and Julia, Mm. um, where she blogs her way through the cookbook. And I was cleaning my house and I had this pile of recipes as I'm watching the movie. I'm like, I'm going to blog my way through this pile of recipes. And I had no idea how to start a blog. So I'm like, I'm Googling how to start a blog. And From there, it was just, the rest is history. I just Googled it and completely self-taught. I was working full-time and blogging on the side and was eventually able to grow my site to where I was able to leave my full-time job and focus 100% on my website. And I haven't looked back since. It's been the best adventure ever. Wow. Wow. Well, and I started in 2013, a little bit after Christina, my youngest had started school and I didn't want to, I still wanted to be there before and after school for my kids. And there are not a lot of jobs that let you have that flexibility. (laughs) Um, 
and actually pay anything. And, you know, even if you've been a stay at home mom for a while, I think once you've worked in the, in the work world, it's really hard to move backwards. And I wasn't willing to. So it's like Christina, I went and got a book. Like, I'm like, Oh, how to blog, read a book. Like that seems easy enough and started it. And yeah, never looked back since it's been my favorite thing to do ever since I started it. <laughs> okay. And you're Corinne. So tell yeah. me about how you guys then met up and started working together and what your mission is. So Christina and I met at a, at a mini conference. It was like a retreat and uh, we had both gotten there early and we laugh about this because it's one of the things like everything we've done since then together, we're trying to recreate the circumstances under which we <laughs> met, like that hotel lobby, meeting someone yeah. at, that's there for an educational purpose. But really, we know all of the secrets and all the magic comes out in those private conversations in between sessions. So we had both got there early. Um, Christina and I, for reference, like she, her, she has a police in her background. I was married to a, a Marine. So we went to this restaurant for, for beignets. Actually, we were in New Orleans and she and I were both kind of friendly <laughs> fighting over the same seat. Um, because as, as coming from the law enforcement background, both of us have been trained. You don't sit with your back to the door. Like you <laughs> want to see who's coming in so you can assess any threats. <laughs> We I don't know why we felt threatened, but we did. We did. I love yeah. that. So, so we were both fighting for the same seat. And then it came out that we had this in common and we've been besties ever since. Essentially. Yeah. So when you set out <laughs> to help bloggers, what did you think they were struggling with the most? Like, where do you think bloggers make the most mistakes? Um, I will definitely say, and this is one thing that I notice time and time again when talking with different influencers, is that we tend to prioritize busy work over activities that are actually going to grow our businesses. So we get caught up in emails that don't matter and scrolling in Facebook and social media things where we're not actually growing our, but doing activities that are growing our business, but we're wasting our time in other things where we think we're busy, but we're not really. Well, we are busy. We're just not making any money. Right. right. <laughs> exactly. We're keeping ourselves active. We're actively doing things, mm -hmm. but you, like you said, where it's just not productive work that's providing a return on our investment of time. Absolutely. I think that it's, oh, you know, one thing that I am always sharing is how does this directly lead to money? And it sounds mm -hmm. really kind of callous, but chances are you're not doing this as just a hobby, right? Like right. there's a difference between a blogger who's just putting their work, their, their thoughts out there, who just wants to express themselves mm -hmm. and women, especially who go, no, 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 this is to make money. This is to send my kid to college one day. Mm -hmm. This is to take that family vacation. So I'm always saying, you know, you think you're just, you're growing your Instagram followers and eventually that's going to make you money. And I say, back that up and tell me, how's it going to make you money today? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes we see. And we're guilty of it too. I mean, I catch myself doing stuff like that all the time. And I actually have to have that conversation with myself is what's the return on, I, I'm always using ROI, the return on investment. And my investment is my time. So what's that return on my time? Am I actually making something back by doing whatever activity it is that we're, that I'm arguing with myself about? <laughs> so let's talk about then when you are advising bloggers about this issue and you say, go this way to make money, go this way to grow your business. What is this way and this way? So actually I want to talk about that for a second. Cause I think that's the other mistake we make as bloggers. The, the most it's chasing what somebody else is telling us to do, chasing someone else's success. All of a sudden somebody's doing well on TikTok and we're like, Oh, we're missing an opportunity. I got to go hop over to TikTok. That may not align with what you want to do. So Christine and I are very consistent. And when we're talking with other bloggers, less consistent in following the advice ourselves. And we always regret it when we don't is that you should pay attention to what's going on in our landscape, but figure out like first and foremost, know where it is you're trying to go. Yes. And then you pick the pieces out of what people are telling you and what you're seeing. And you fit that into your game plan, but you got to get solid there first. Like, am I, am I all about, like, I want to 
I want to build my site or do I really want to build a brand and be you know, famous? Do I want to work with a lot of brands? Do I want to do sponsorships? Because your approach for landing a lot of sponsorships is very different than your approach if you want to make a lot of money from creating your own products or you want a lot of passive income, right? But you need to know what that is. All right, let's and- go walk. Oh, I love this. Let's walk down these different paths. Sure. Okay. So when you talk about this and you say, hey, so for, let's say a beginning blogger, somebody who already has a blog and is getting traffic and let's say an expert blogger, let's start with the beginning blogger. What do you recommend as a way to quick start their income? Right out of the gate, I would say there's two things you need to focus on. Number one is SEO, right? You need to learn the current SEO practices and how you can make the most of that when creating your content. Um, one of the mistakes I made when I first started out blogging, and I'm, I'm still correcting them today, 12 years later, is I was creating recipes I wanted, mm-hmm. right? I'm just mm. things that I wanted to make. I was just making them. I didn't give a thought to SEO and what people were searching for. So now I'm a little more strategic. I'll still make things because I want to make them and I'll post them on my website, but I'm more strategic in creating my editorial calendar in looking to see what are people actually searching for. Mm. Um, I would say the other thing I would tell people to focus on right out of the gate is email and mm. email marketing, because that is the one consistent. I mean, It's constant over any of the social networks, which are so volatile in today's society. Okay. So to back that up a little bit, when you say looking for opportunities, how often do you recommend I be blogging and creating new, highly optimized for SEO content? So I would... Every, and I hate this about our industry that everything comes back to an, it depends, right? Like, it, yeah. but it, it does, it does depend. And, and I hate that answer when people give it to me, but I'll justify the answer here. In my opinion, you should never put out a piece of content that isn't going to be the absolute best answer to that. So for SEO purposes, should yeah. be, it should be with the absolute best response. Now, if you can only manage to do that once a week, then that's how often you publish it, right? But if you've got more bandwidth, you've got the ability to do that on a more regular basis, then do it more more often. It's a numbers game, right? Like mm-hmm. the amount of mm-hmm. amount of keywords you go after, the more that you are after that you can rank for, the more traffic you will get, the faster yeah. you'll succeed. But if you can only put together a high quality piece of content and you can only do that once a week, do that as opposed to putting out three low pieces of con- you know, low quality content three times a week, right? Okay. Like, yeah. So it does depend. I agree. But the more you can do, the better and the faster you'll scale. I mean, it's just, that's just math. And the one piece of advice Corinne gave to me, because we had this conversation a few weeks ago, um, I was sitting on a bunch of content that I had updated and she's like, it is not making you any money just sitting there in draft format, get it out. So even if you have it, you know, just publish it, get it out there and let it start doing something and percolating. You don't have to sit on it and dribble it out. Mm. Now let's talk about I don't work for Google, but I'm pretty sure Google doesn't give you a perfect (laughs) attendance award for publishing every day. I like that. So... If you've got the content and it's ready to go, why don't you have it out there? Because it's, it's not getting you any traffic. It's not doing yeah. any better in search while it's in draft mode. Absolutely. Okay. So let's talk about email. Cause that was the other thing that you recommended mm-hmm. grow your email list. Why? Yes. Because when you have that email address, you are able to regularly communicate with that person, right? They, you are getting that invitation into their inbox. And a lot of people are very um, private about their giving out their email. So when they trust you enough to give that to you, they are giving you the okay to come into their inbox on a regular basis and share your new content with them. Where on social media, it's more it's more haphazard. It's like scrolling through TV channels, right? You're just kind of scrolling. You don't have that um, relationship uh, where they're actually trading you something for something else. And Mm. I just think email is the smarter way to go. I mean, you once you have that email address until they unsubscribe, you are able to actively reach out to them where on social media, you are at the whim of that algorithm. Absolutely. Well, and you control more of the you control more of the sales funnel at the point that you're selling products. 
If you yes. put a link, like if you put a link on Instagram, maybe Instagram will show that to people. Maybe not, you know, maybe someone will open the email, maybe not, but if they didn't open it on email, I can send them another one. I can tag them if they hit some certain things. So I know what offers to target them with. I don't have any of that capability on social, you know, all the social networks lock down their analytics to some extent um, for mm-hmm. privacy concerns, which is great, but at least an email, you can tag people like they're engaging specifically with you directly with you. Mm-hmm. So you can know that this person likes instant pot recipes. They don't like air fryer and you don't send them your air fryer stuff. You're not annoying them. So it's a better service to them. It's a better conversion for sales just yeah. all around. It's a better experience for everyone. Okay. So what I hear you saying is beginning blogger, focus on creating content for your blog, for Google, that is SEO optimized, that is solving specific problems and grow your email list. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Now I'm that mid-level blogger. So I'm starting to get traffic. I am maybe making a little bit in ad income, Um, maybe I'm making a little bit in affiliate sales. How do I accelerate my business where I'm starting to see some traction, not a lot of money, but some traction. What does that person do? To me, it's product sales. So once you have a certain amount of traffic, so and for everybody, it's different. But once you've, you're in with an ad network, because I feel like the ad revenue jumps dramatically when you can get in with an ad work a network that actually pays you a high RPM. So once you can get in with Media Vine or Ad Thrive, and you've got good passive income coming from your ad revenue, so you have some time to breathe. You have some time because early stages, I think we a lot, most people I know get muddied down in sponsored work because mm, they'll pay you a paycheck. Let's talk now. about that. Let's talk about that. So what happens is, let's say I've grown my Instagram and a blog Mm -hmm. sees that. I've got 10,000 followers on Instagram. And I, again, I think somehow when I hit a magic number, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, money's going to like fly in the windows, but brands are reaching out to me. So initially brands are saying, Hey, I want to give you some, some product. And your thought for that is yay or nay. Am I going to do it? Yay. Yay. All right. Mm -hmm. But then brands are coming to me and saying, hey, I've got a budget of a couple hundred bucks. However, I need you to jump through these hoops in order to get that money. And I might go back to you and go, I don't like your photos. You know, I don't like that video. You're going to have to redo it, rework it. What is your thought about that? Do I do that work? So, and this is where I feel like Again, it's an, it depends answer. It's what your (laughs) threshold is. But for me, I'm stingy with my time. I'm super, and I always have been, even when I wasn't making much money with my blog, I was stingy with my time. So like to me, that stuff, and I made the mistake a few times because when you're first starting out, you don't know that that's going to happen. But the first time that I had to go redo an entire post from then on, it was in my contract. I'm not like, you only get one edit or we won't redo, you know, images, whatever it was. And for me, it was photography. It always came down to photography. I was not reshooting images. Um, so, and if they, if they wanted me to do that, it was, they'd pay another 50% of the fee to get me to do so. Um, Cause it's, or they needed to be specific about what shots they wanted. So they made sure that like that way I knew I didn't make the mistake in the photography. So okay. again, you've got to know your boundaries. So just like you need to know what it is that you want to happen, you need to know your boundaries. And when it comes to sponsored work, this is another thing I think people should do early on is again, even when you're a baby blogger, and I don't mean a baby, but like, that's what I considered myself when I had small blog, it was a baby blog. I was a baby blogger. I didn't have impressive numbers anywhere. What I wish I had done then, uh, and it took me a little while to figure it out, was to really figure out my vision of what I wanted Mm. to be doing with my blog. It will change. It will change because like you'll get a book deal or things will happen or you'll get speaking gigs, things that you didn't anticipate would happen. But in as much as possible, figure out where it is you want to be making your money. Do you like passive income? Do you really like working with brands? Whatever that is. But figure that out early so that when you take sponsored work, because it is a key part of the revenue, it's a key revenue stream for most bloggers Mm -hmm. at some stage in your journey. So if you figure that out early, Mm -hmm. that you're going to want passive income, you're not going to work, want to work with brands forever. You'll be more selective about the brands you work with Mm -hmm. because they'll fit better with your, and the content that you create will be evergreen. Mm -hmm. Like that was when 
So now I still make money on my sponsored posts, which was not something that occurred to me that I could do for the first mm-hmm. year uh, that I was doing sponsored work. I was always just trying to make the client happy. And I wasn't thinking necessarily about what was going to serve my blog in the long term and what was going to serve my readers in the long term. Mm-hmm. I think you would do that a little bit faster if you yeah. <laughs> figured things so- out sooner. Since we're talking all about how bloggers make money on the internet, I welcome you to grab my free PDF download called The Five Secrets Successful Bloggers Already Know to Make Six and Seven Figures. These are the things you want to start setting up in your own business. I wish I knew this when I was just starting out. So to grab it, go to milotree.com dot com slash secrets milotree.com slash secrets and now back to the show so i have a couple of points here when since we're talking about sponsored content number one when we first started way back in the old days (laughs) there wasn't the plethora of resources that there is today, right? There's all kinds of free groups that you can get in and pick people's brains and other influencers' brains who have been there, done that, and get kind of the baseline of what you need to do and you know, like what you need to include in a contract and what you should be looking for. So that's super important. Are you, so by the way, are you st- talking about Facebook groups? Is that where- yes, Facebook groups? Okay. Yes, or you know, wherever you you congregate. Um, digitally with people. So if it's a mastermind, a Facebook group, wherever, bounce ideas off of them and reach out and crowdsource for some information. But do your own due diligence and check into everything. The other thing I'm going to say is you have to know your value, right? You have to Mm. know what your time is worth. Like Corinne said, she's stingy with her time. So it's going, she values that at a higher level. If right now all you have is time to give, your value might be a little lower and you might be able to do the work for a little lower. So you need to, to think about that and what the val- how you value your time. And, um, and well, I think that, that that is super important. And I was just going to add, you could do a very easy back of the envelope calculation yep. and say, how much money am I making currently? What yep. is my per hour income? How yep. many hours is this sponsor post really going to take? Because right. I would say, come up with an estimate and double or triple it. Yes. Because we are bad prognosticators around time. That's and then true. do the, you know, do the math and say, okay, they want to pay me $300, $3,000. Like, what does that look like on a per hour basis? Yep. And does this fall within what is acceptable to me? Right. Yes. And I actually, I have a spreadsheet that I use to calculate that all out. I have every step of the process for doing a sponsored post. And just so I don't forget, and I can get a baseline number and I say, okay, this step is going to take me two hours. This is my hourly rate. This step is going to take me three hours. This is my hourly rate. And then I total it all up at the end and see where I'm at. And does this make the, does this number make sense to me? And then I go from there. It's like a jumping off point. And one thing I want to say is the numbers, especially if you're working directly with like a PR, like directly with the brand, which usually is a PR agency, those numbers are fungible. Meaning (laughs) at a certain point, you know, you do the math and you go, oh, Mm -hmm. wow, they want to pay me $500, which seems like a ton of money. But when I do this calculation, I need to be paid a thousand dollars. Guess what? Go back to them at a thousand dollars. Cause if they say no, who cares? It's not worth your time, but go maybe even ask for 1500, like go be ballsy and see what happens. It just, cause they put a number down doesn't mean it's the final number. Right. Right. And like, I personally have a rule and I call it like working for the jar of mayonnaise. Right. So if a company came and offered me a jar of mayonnaise to do a sponsored post, I'm probably, and I use the word probably, probably not going to do it. And now I may give them like a social shout out if I like them or, you know, whatever. But you also have to think about where this connection can lead down the road, right? Mm -hmm. Is there potential to make a connection that will be more lucrative later on? And is this just your foot in the door offer? Mm -hmm. So while it may not be the exact thing you want right now, it doesn't have the potential to be better later. And are you building that relationship? So you always have to think about that. Like Corinne said, there's no it's always an, it depends, right? There's no magic. Mm -hmm. There's no magic number. There's no magic answer. You really have to think about everything. Yes. Now you, 
Corinne mentioned products. And I, as you know, with Milo Tree Easy Payments, which is going to be branded Milo Tree Cart very soon, um, I am a big fan of selling to your audience. And oh I'm God. all about selling your knowledge to your audience. And my hypothesis, which I keep getting proved true, it keeps getting proved true over and over again, is if you have an audience, there's money to be made selling directly to them. And this is why, again, Christina, you talking about growing that email list is mm -hmm. so valuable because these are typically the people who will buy your offer. So can you guys speak to where you're seeing success with people selling products? So right off the bat, and because you know we we talk to people a lot about this lot because this is one, it's a new revenue stream, especially for a newer blogger. It's one that we don't, it's not one that most people jump right into, right? Like normally we're trying to make ad revenue. We do the sponsored work and then you eventually get to affiliate sales. Well, if you can make affiliate sales, you can sell your own products and then you keep mm -hmm. all of the money. Um, but the easiest way to do it for people that are a little shy about that and you don't want to invest a lot of time, like all of my initial products were content I had already created. I just mm. repackaged them and then attached a feed to it. So I do a lot of printables, for example, um, on my site. So I would bundle them. And even though you could get every single one and like same with my recipes, every single one of the recipes in my first cookbook was already published on my site. If you wanted to spend all day hopping around on my site to get them, you could, but we have time or you have money. It's always a trade-off between those two. And you will find that many, many people would rather spend the money. So you because start, they value their time. So yeah. tell me about one thing we were talking about before we press record was proof of concept. Like you started with a tripwire and you mm -hmm. saw that it worked. Can you share that story? Yes. So and what I a tripwire been... is and how yes. you were able to figure this out. Okay. So I'll start with what it was and, and then back into the language. So I had a lot of instant pot recipes and they were doing very well. So I had a lot of posts already that people were landing on. And I'm like, oh, I want to start getting their, getting their email address. So I created this instant pot cheat sheet that was an opt-in, right? So you what was the cheat get, sheet? What, what, like, it was what? just like, uh, for a lot of the foods that you would routinely cook in the instant pot, just the cooking times, like what to set it at and how long. Um, so just a, a sheet of the most commonly cooked items, right? And it's just something that, that you're meant to print off and keep, you know, with your instant pot or, you know, on the refrigerator or whatever. So it's super simple. It didn't take that long to create and people would opt in for it. You land on the, the post and you would see that I had this cheat sheet, you give me your email address to get it. And then you'd get every week, my new instant pot recipe as well. Um, so once I had enough instant pot recipes, I just took them all and put them in a PDF and made an instant pot cookbook. And did Again, you make this on Canva? How'd you do this? Like, is it pretty? So this was, it, it was not especially pretty. No, I, I, <laughs> this was way back when I did it in Microsoft word. Okay. Um, yeah. So okay. it wasn't pretty. Love I did it. one, I think I did the, I did a photo index. So you could see what each of them were supposed to look like. I did that in Canva, but on each, I didn't have it for each recipe. So it was, the photo index was at the front and it's actually, it's exactly the same. I've never revamped that cookbook. It's exactly the same if you opt in on my cheat sheet. So you, what happens now is you sign up, you're on an Instant Pot recipe, you see the cheat sheet advertised, you fill in your email, and then it takes you to what I call the tripwire page. Which is and the thank you, know, you page. Like usually when you, you sign up for somebody's email list, you get this page. And the weird part is everybody sees it. Right, right. So it's anybody, like anybody who signs up your list sees it. It's like a highly valuable page. So instead of it just being like, thank you for joining my, you know, or, you right. know, I'll be sending the uh, cheat sheet in the, in your email, whatever you decided to use. Right. That. And it still does say that. Thank you for signing up. And here's the beauty of, of this step is they have just given you their email address. They are already on the Instant Pot site. They know who you are. They know what you, why they are communicating with you. So this is the most connected. Ironically, they're going to feel with you unless they stick around for years to come and are opening all of your emails, right? Mm -hmm. So they still know who you are. You're not a stranger to them. So you say, thanks so much for signing up. Hey, to welcome you here, I've got a special offer. I've got this Instant Pot cookbook. 
And I am, I'm not confident when it comes to pricing. So I always price things really low. So my QuickBook was $4.99 full price and I tripwired it at $2.99. So you so gave for, a discount. Mm-hmm. Okay. So like to welcome you, like, it, like it's a big favor to them, right? Like to welcome you, you've got this special offer. You're never going to see it again. And they really don't. Like I am, I hold to that. Like I want to be true to my word. You, you get it now for 40% off. Or it's always available in my store if you want to buy it for full price. But right now you can get it for $2.99. And what happened when you rolled this out? So many conversions. Like I don't think that thing had been live for an hour and I'd already made two sales, Um, which doesn't sound like a lot. But the fact that I hadn't sold anything before, this was miraculous to me. Mm -hmm. And every single day, every single day, even through low traffic times, I sell one of those. Every single day I get notifications for that. Um, And it's only $3, but it's like, I know once I set it up, I don't do anything else with it. I made thousands of dollars off that cookbook. Here's the thing that I think is even more empowering about what you just said. You, people were willing to take out their credit card for you and buy a product that you created. When Mm -hmm. I am helping people set up a paid workshop with Milo Tree Easy Payments, AKA Milo Tree Cart, and they get sales. Like the first sale, they will typically message me and go, somebody purchased. And I can feel them almost like coming into their own as an entrepreneur in a whole new way. Because it's not just like, hey, I made this Instapot recipe, check it out if you like, of course it's for free. But it's like, I made something of value that you're willing to pay for. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think, mind blowing for many of us. Yeah. And I think today too, like you mentioned, your product makes it easy for them to sell. There's so many tools out there today that makes it easy to create these products. Like you mentioned Canva. So that's one of the tools I use, but I also went out on creative market and bought a template for the ebook. So I didn't have to worry about the design. I purchased the template. It was a one-time fee. I think it was like 20 bucks and I can use it over and over and over again to create different ebook. So not just one, right? So Corinne has our instant pot one. I created one for flavored moonshine recipes because that was some of the most popular content on my site. So I'm like, people are flocking to these recipes. What else can I do? I created an ebook where I'm giving them even more recipes. And that one sells for me like hotcakes. I mean, it's fantastic, but I didn't have to worry about you know, designing the whole ebook myself and everything. I just or hiring that. somebody to do it yeah. for you. Yep. 20 bucks. I bought the template. I imported it into Canva and it's just drag and drop and put in some text and it was done. I mean, it's something you could do in a weekend really quickly. Mm, I love that. Okay. So let's talk about, there are two things. One, okay, so now we've talked about this mid-level blogger and your recommendation is continue to grow your email list, continue to work on your posts and now start, and now you're making say some money with sponsors, but you're being particular about which ones you decide to work with. Maybe you're making some money with affiliates and then start exploring product sales. Product sales can also be, hey, sign up for a coaching session with me and get that Mm -hmm. one-on-one experience. I know that somebody I've worked with helps people set up their gardens, right? And she teaches Mm -hmm. all about that. And again, same idea. You can go to her blog, get all of that information. But if you have specific questions about your garden and you want to book a call with her and she'll go through what she recommends you do, Godspeed. That's another product that you can sell. Okay. So now let's talk about the person who's like kind of cooking and, and growing. What is your thought for that person to really accelerate their business? So this is why I like product sales. Cause I feel like once you open that door, that like it balloons out because you go from tripwire to now you create some other products and you've got a bump offer, a cross sell offer that you can offer them with that. Then you bundle things together and you've got an upsell. So all of a sudden that cart value goes from $3 to $30 and you've 10 times your income. Mm -hmm. And you haven't really added a lot of work. And again, most of these product sales, once you set them up and you set up your email sequences, you set up all the things that sell it, it's set and forget for the most part. Like most of my funnels, once I set them up, other than tweaking them, like I don't go back and touch them. So they just continue to make money. So 
once you've got that, like you can scale all of your income very quickly. And then I will say the piece that never goes away is the traffic driving though. Like Mm. I most, I'd say half of my like on time, like active work time is still dedicated to figuring out keyword research, what niches to go after. It is driving more traffic because the trap, it's a numbers game, right? So the more traffic you can push into the system, the more people you can get on your list, the more conversions you can get on your tripwire, the more sales you'll make overall, the more affiliate clicks you'll get. Like everything ties to the traffic coming in. So that piece never goes away. Um, I love. I could have 10, I don't have 10 million page views, but at the (laughs) point that I'd still be going for a hundred million, like there's never going to be anything. I have to say, you know, I interview so many successful bloggers on my site and I will say that they have followed the ones who are making seven figures, um, have done exactly what you guys have outlined and they are making the majority of their money via product sales. Mm-hmm. They're still making a ton of money. A lot yeah. of them have tremendous traffic, mm-hmm. but really when they've been able to figure out that product piece, then they can start selling higher ticket things like masterminds mm-hmm. or whatever, mm-hmm. and they, or memberships and they've been able to, or courses, although, you know, we talked about this before, right. I want to say, if you're thinking about creating a course, really consider how much time that's going to take and how much time that's going to take to sell. And I personally recommend starting with a paid workshop and testing your idea in front of some live people. So that's just Mm -hmm. my take on that. But let's talk about, you know, the one thing we haven't mentioned, I feel like if we rewound time a year, two years ago, it would all be Pinterest. And notice Pinterest has not come up one time. So both are smiling a, and nodding. <laughs> so that's a very have interesting on Pinterest. <laughs> we do. We have thoughts on it. Um, so I'm going to say we all know Pinterest is having an identity crisis, right? They don't know what they want to be in this social media landscape that we're in right now. But both Corinne and I have not given up on Pinterest. Mm. We've maintained our activity there. We haven't focused and made it like it used to be where you were spending X amount of time every day, really doing work in Pinterest, but we haven't given up on it completely because you don't know where it's going to go. Mm. Right. And you like, I personally wouldn't want to give up on it until it's done and dead. Mm. And I don't think it's done and dead. I still get Pinterest traffic to my site. Are you doing all of the things like videos and creating on the con on, on the platforms true with Pinterest. I think if you are actually analyzing the data and seeing what's working, if you have Pinterest traffic coming to your site, really digging in and seeing what that content is, how it's coming, you know, like what, what's driving it to your site from Pinterest and then doing more of that, Mm. I think is the smart way to do it. And then while here and there testing out some of the new things because you don't know how it's going to work and you have to be willing to test. What would you add to that, Corinne? So I'd say like with Pinterest, it's a business, right? Like I feel like as long as we remember that about all of the platforms that we use, you remember that they're businesses with goals of their own. Pinterest wants to make money. You know, they went public. We knew there was going to be an issue. I was afraid that they were going to really push advertising, which they have, but you know, that was going to be pay to play over there, much like Facebook became for a while, but ultimately Pinterest wants to make money. So you see a lot of like fashion's doing really well. there, beauty's doing really well there. It may not be the platform for food Mm -hmm. bloggers necessarily moving Mm -hmm. forward, Mm -hmm. but the user experience has degraded substantially. Mm -hmm. And I hear it like, because, you know, mm-hmm. we do, we have friends in real life and I, all my friends are irritated with it. You have a recipe, you, you get, they don't understand these idea pins. So you mm-hmm. watch this video and then they click to go through and it doesn't click anywhere. It doesn't go anywhere, but they can't make the recipe because recipe creators <laughs> aren't, they're make, not making a TikTok. They're not trying to show you how to do the whole thing. We're still trying to get you to our site. Mm-hmm. So Pinterest, in my mind, has to adjust. And I could be way wrong on that, right? But they have to adjust. They, for a long time, wanted to be a visual search engine. Mm -hmm. And then that changed. And they tried this other stuff. And I don't think it's working. 
I don't. Mm. Now I will say my shop is doing very well. I sell a lot more. So if you've got a store or you've got products, push that on Pinterest because those are doing well and I'm not having to pay advertising dollars yet. That might change. But I do think Pinterest is going to have to do an adjustment because they, people are leaving in droves and yeah. I don't have any numbers to back that up. I only have anecdotal evidence from talking to people that I interact with in real life, right? <laughs> like, which is one of our information gathering means. So people don't like it. They're not using it. Pinterest can't make money if nobody's on it. Mm-hmm. So All right. I mean, mind, back in the day, it used to be where I went to find, if I was looking for a recipe for something, that's where I would go. I could get what I wanted and, you know, pin it to my board and make my own little recipe books in my boards. Now you can't do that. So I just, it's not my go-to place when I'm looking for a recipe content. I personally don't go there because I'm not going to watch an idea pin and then not get the link to get the recipe. I'm not there to be entertained. Right. If I want entertainment, I'm on TikTok and I'm watching right, there. there other- I'm being entertained with recipes. And then the other thing to me is there's a lot of bloat over at Pinterest. They went public and all of a sudden they had all these different departments. So they had Pinterest creators, but then those people would show up, they were hosting conferences and things. So they'd fly people in from all over the country. You'd go, they'd tell you one thing, but then you've got some email address that you contact for something else. And they have no idea what they're talking about. Recommended pin size. You could talk to six different people at Pinterest and you get six different pin size recommendations, right? Like nobody knew what everyone was doing. To me, that is bloat in an organization. And I've never known a successful business that survived that. So Mm -hmm. I have faith. Someone's going to come in, some, the CEO is going to wake up and be like, we need to clean this up. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's going, I, so it's just me. It's my anecdotal, Mm -hmm. my opinion, Mm -hmm. it will clear up. And I think those of us that stuck with it and still had content going out continuously will be rewarded for our patients, either that, or they'll never get their act together. And it's going to go belly up and we gambled wrong. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So now you guys sell tools for bloggers. Mm -hmm. Can you just share what you guys do as we wrap this up and how people can follow you, uh, join all of your stuff and and learn more? Sure. So Corinne and I are all about, and this is one of the things we connected on when we first met, is we're all about- Not just where to sit. Not just where to sit. Not just where to sit. No. (laughs) Once we got the seating arrangements down. The other really weird thing we had in common- (laughs) is we like to work, we like to organize and um, organizing our data and just making sure our businesses are organized and working smarter and streamlining processes. So we're not wasting time doing the same thing over and over and over again. So we are huge on templates. And then we both at one point discovered a mutual love of a product called Airtable. And it's um, a project management tool similar to, you might've heard like Asana or Trello, um, you know, a tool like that, but Airtable does so much more. And we both fell in love with it and started playing with it. And it's almost like a spreadsheet in a database had a baby. Mm. Um, But we have found while we love to do stuff like this, and we like to talk in spreadsheet speak and organize (laughs) things in columns and rows. Many creative influencers do not enjoy that at all. So what we did was we've built our systems um, on how we manage our website. And we both have numerous, several websites that we manage now. Um, But we've built our systems in Airtable and we're now sharing them with other influencers. So Um, how to manage like ways that we manage our behind the scenes business, ways that we manage our content and, you know, keep track of everything we're publishing or the ideas we have or what's in production, whether it's video or written content, Um, our social media shares, that's one of our more popular ones. And we, we have a pin strategy that we actually use where we can live pin and it takes us only 10 minutes a day because the system we set up in Airtable tells us what to pin and where. And it's all automatic. So we go in, we pin it, we mark the date. And then the next time we're ready to pin, it's going to tell us what to do and where. So that's the great thing about having a tool like that to help you system, sy- systematize and mm. automate what you're doing so that you're not you're working smarter and not harder. So where right. can people find this? Over on our website, thesmartinfluencer.com, we have um, a listing there of the different products that we offer. Um, We have a number of different ones on there. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. And you guys have a podcast. We do. Yep. So you can also find the link to our podcast on the, on the smart influencer.com, but the name of the podcast is the smart influencer podcast. And then we're also on social media, uh, as the smart influencer. So, yeah. <laughs> Branding. <laughs> Wonderful. So Wonderful. can I just take a second? I want to tell two of our newer products that we have out there are kind of exciting. Cause I think they really fill a need that has come up very recently. You see it in all the Facebook groups. So the first one is we have a legacy organizer. So it's really a way for you to organize all of the critical information about your business. If God forbid something should happen to you and somebody needs to figure out what to do with your business, right? Mm. Because I know my husband doesn't even know the password to get into my computer. So he would be lost. If something were to happen to me, he would not know what to do where anything is. So this was a problem Corinne and I had thought about, and we created a solution um, or a template within Airtable that will track and organize all of that information to make it super easy for anyone, people who are not (laughs) technology Mm. and um, spreadsheet nerds like us. And then we are coming out with one where you can organize your SOPs or your standard operating procedures. Cause that's Mm. something that a lot of people are talking about today is getting your processes and your operating procedures organized and in a way that you can track them and find them and make sure that they're up to date. Wow. Wow. All right, you guys. And what are their, your own personal blogs? So my main site's wonder mom wannabe. So wonder mom wannabe.com. Okay. And Christina. mine is it, mine is, it is a keeper. It nice. is a keeper.com. Nice. Well, Christina and Corinne, thank you guys both for being on the show. Thank you so much, Jillian. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Jillian. I hope you guys like this episode with Christina and Corinne. What I thought was so interesting is how like-minded we all were about the stages of growing your business, kind of what it looks like as you go from beginner to intermediate to advanced. And what is not surprising is the idea that the most successful bloggers sell products to their audiences. And this is, again, where Milo Tree Cart comes in. It is a way for you to monetize your audience. If you have an email list, if you have a social media following, if you have traffic to your blog, there is money to be made. It is just about figuring out what problem you can solve for your audience and then testing different ideas, different solutions that connect. Because as soon as you find that connection, boom, That's gold. And you can build off of that and build an enormous business. So please sign up for your free account at milotreecart.com. Play around, go have fun, go test it out. And let me know what you think. Email me at jillian at milotree.com with any questions you have, any thoughts, product suggestions, or if you'd like some help. And I will see you here again next week. (laughs) 